Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Wednesday afternoon lecture. Um, I'm going to hand over to Tanya Marshall to in introduce James, and then uh, I'll keep admitting people as they come in. Now, as people come in, they're, they're automatically muted and the video is not showing. Uh, so you probably see the three of us throughout the, throughout the meeting. Uh, if you, there's a raised hand function and after James has finished speaking, we can take questions and he'll provide us with answers that will solve the problems of the world, including, including the coronavirus issue. <laughs> <laughs> Tanya, do you want to take over and start the... <laughs> Tanya, do you want to take over? Okay. Morning, everybody, and welcome to today's um, GSSA lunchtime lecture. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping issues. Everybody, please keep your video off. It saves bandwidth for those who may not be on a stable connection. Also, make sure your audio is off. Both video and audio bottom left-hand corner, you will see a microphone icon and a video icon. Make sure they are both off. If you click on participants, which is in the, towards the middle of your screen, you will get a list of, of everybody who's on the, the meeting and you will see a little raise hand function. During question time, when you want to ask questions, please click on that. You'll get called on and then to, to talk, don't bother to unmute yourself in the corner. Just hold the space bar down. It temporarily unmutes you. And then you can talk, and then when you release the space bar, you go back to being mute. Okay, everybody video off, please. Uh, we've still got a couple of people with video on. Forty-five. Forty-five. Okay, uh, our speaker today needs little introduction. He is James Campbell, who has spent over 30 years in the diamond industry in a variety of leadership roles, both in major and junior companies. Mm -hmm. And I've had the pleasure of working with him yeah. in some of these over the years. He is currently the Managing Director of Botswana Diamonds PLC and is also a non-exec at Sheffer Gems ATM. Previously, he's held leadership roles at Rockwell Diamonds, Stella Diamonds, Lakara Diamonds, African Diamonds, West African Diamonds, and also De Beers, where he spent over 20 years with notable appointments, including General Manager for Exploration and Nikki Oppenheimer's personal assistant. James is also chairman of the Leadership Development Nonprofit Organization, Common Purpose SA. James holds a degree in Mining and Exploration Geology from the Royal School of Mines at Imperial College in London and an MBA with distinction from Durham University. He is a fellow of the IOM Cubed, SAIMM and the Institute of Directors. He's also a chartered engineer, a chartered scientist, and registered with as a PR Signet. And so James is very well qualified to talk to us on today's topic, the role of geoscientists in junior exploration companies. James, we look forward to listening to you. Thank you very much indeed, Tanya. Can you, can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, we can all hear you well, thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya, and thank you very much indeed, Craig, for kindly inviting me. This presentation was first given in, in July of last year to uh, a number of uh, junior uh, or, or young geologists and those at university studying geology to find out about what the life of a geoscientist is in, in a junior exploration company. It's a slightly tongue-in-cheek presentation, uh, as you'll see from uh, the slide on the screen at the moment. Uh, on the left-hand side, you've got the geoscientist in a junior exploration, 
uh, company being a, a, a large goldfish in a small pond. And as, as Tanya said, that I, I spent over 20 years at a large corporate, uh, and therein is your small goldfish in a, a, a large uh, tub. So getting straight into the presentation itself, uh, th this is my agenda. I'm firstly going to give a, a, a brief comparison of, of juniors and majors. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the role of a geoscientist in the junior company. A and what is that role? Firstly, a jack of all trades and, and a master of many, uh, a technophile and a low tech pro as well. One can't ever forget that little piece. A problem solver and a handyman, a servant leader and a diplomat, a communicator, and quite importantly, which some may not realize, that it's not only just a career, it's a lifestyle too as well. And then before I touch on my concluding remarks, what does success uh, look like at the end of the day? This presentation is peppered with, with slides from uh, the number of companies I've had the privilege of working with over the past few years. And in this slide here, there's a picture of the Sheffield Gems uh, Chief Operating Officer's office. I think this is probably one of the most uh, picturesque uh, geologist's office I've seen in my travels around the world. And, uh, and when you get to have a look at this presentation later in more detail, you could look at the intense detail and passion uh, for geology this, this lady has, uh, Miss Verid Toledo. So, juniors and majors. Obviously, there's going to be a, a distinct slant in this presentation uh, towards diamonds. No apologies for that. I've spent almost 35 years of my career uh, in the diamond industry, just over 20 years in, in a major and, and the last 15 or so years in uh, a junior. On this slide, you'll, of course, all have heard of De Beers, BHP, Anglo American, Valet and, and Rio Tinto. And on the right hand slide, you, you may not have heard of all of these companies as these are junior. Sheffer Gems, which is developing a, a precious stone, including a uh, diamond deposit in, in the north of Israel. Uh, Pangolin Diamonds, which is a TSX V listed company exploring for diamonds in Botswana. Blue Rock Diamonds, a London AIM company uh, mining the Kariflay Kimberlites uh, just north of Kimberley, Kimberley, Botswana Diamonds, which is a company I work for, uh, and that has diamond development projects across Southern Africa, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and South Africa, and then Vast Resources, uh, which is about to develop the Marangi Diamond Fields in the east of Zimbabwe. So, if, if I kick off this presentation by giving some of the, uh, the major traits of juniors and, and compare that with majors. Starting with juniors itself, uh, they tend to be or have been over the last 20 years or so, the exploration division of the mining industry itself. These are the people who go out and, and discover the new deposits. And, and typically, uh, once they get to feasibility study, possibly before that, they get bought out by a major who then develops the mine itself. They're typically small cap companies who raise equity to do their exploration work. And that equity in today's market uh, typically comes from high net worth individuals, management, uh, the board, and uh, less so from mining and, and other funds which used to invest in this space before the global financial crisis of 2009. They don't pay dividends because they consume money because that money is used for exploration work. And interestingly, and, and maybe a, a lesser known fact is they are, uh, they do undergo the same degree of public scrutiny uh, that major companies do have, and they do have very deep technical management teams. But possibly the, the key differentiator between a, a major and a junior is a junior is innovative, agile, and fast. If I briefly touch on, on majors, uh, these typically fund their own exploration, they're well-capitalized companies. Uh, their exploration spend is, is approved by their board of directors, uh, unlike a junior who has to uh, go to the market and, and seek funding. Uh, they tend to have steady predictable cash flow. Uh, some of my major colleagues may disagree with me uh, on that, but they ain't seen anything yet uh, if it compares with a, a junior. 
They tend to have complex decision-making processes, uh, significant internal assurance processes, and can be uh, bureaucratic and slow moving. So they're, they're two very different uh, uh, roles in the, in the industry itself. And obviously I'm gonna be more focusing on juniors in this particular presentation. So for a junior, what is the scale of activities? In a large company, uh, for example, when I worked at De Beers, we, we spanned all the diamond exploration domains of the world, be it uh, Canada, Russia, Australia, India, China, Africa, and, and South America. Typically with a junior though, you would focus on one, perhaps two, we have seven in, in Botswana diamond uh, project areas, and you tend not to hold onto your prospecting licenses uh, for a long period of time, you do your work and you relinquish them uh, very quickly because after all, uh, these prospecting licenses uh, consume a, a lot of money. And so for an exploration company, junior, the prospecting licenses you hold are not real estate. It's all about getting in there, doing the work quickly as you can, uh, moving on to new licenses uh, with an area or developing those projects which have the legs to actually develop. As far as formal training is concerned, uh, that if you work for a large company, you'll be very familiar uh, with a, a very structured training program, whether it be in mines or in exploration, uh, lots of very formal mentorship programs. In the junior space, this is much, much less so. Uh, these are a couple of slides from my experience at Rockwell where we did have a very intense uh, mentorship program. We were also very active in terms of uh, presenting at Diamond conferences, but we were not able to have the huge structure that came about uh, with a large company. Notwithstanding that, I think that the geologists that went through the Rockwell stable ended up being uh, very well-rounded geologists who are now flourishing in the junior mining industry itself. And it's not just about training the geologist itself. Uh, I know certainly when I worked for De Beers and Anglo-American, they had fantastic programs of working with aspirant geologists. These are uh, students who are at the matric level or maybe a year before who would eventually want to go and study geology and then become a geologist. Junior companies are also active in this space, but of course uh, don't necessarily have the amount of money uh, that the majors have. And on the left-hand side, you'll see a, a picture of some work that we were doing with the Sparrow Foundation School uh, in Johannesburg, a great bunch of kids who come from very disadvantaged backgrounds, many of which uh, who now want to join our fantastic profession. And on the right-hand side, you'll see a, a, a good mixture of ages and uh, uh, demographics in terms of on-the-job training uh, of a, a young Batomi graduate uh, looking at drill chips. There's my colleague Lanesh Lachman Singh, who many of you know, who's a deeply experienced uh, diamond explorationist. Another very important facet of being uh, a geoscientist in a, a junior exploration company is that you are also your public relations department. Uh, typically in a, a large company, there would be a public relations department with events, public relations, social media, communications, and they would look after all of this stuff actually for you. But a geoscientist in a, a junior company, uh, particularly if he or she is at a, a senior level in the company, would have to manage their own uh, social media presence, which is such a, a, a vital thing. Look what the GSS, GSSA are leading with at the moment. They are doing the Zoom uh, free lunchtime talks, which is really maximizing uh, our social media presence uh, whilst we're all under lockdown. But this also extends to YouTube, to Twitter, to Facebook, to LinkedIn, to Instagram, and, and all sorts of other things. And I invite you after uh, this talk and uh, whilst you're still under lockdown, to actually not just only look at the, uh, the great links the GSSA has circulated, uh, but also the links that we have on Botswana Diamonds too, uh, where we try and keep uh, our stakeholders, which include our investors, right up to date. 
A very important point on this slide too as well is that it's not just about doing this kind of stuff because it's very, very important, but you'll see on the left-hand side of the slide there, a social media audit. So, and this is something uh, that you can take to your board to actually try and determine the value uh, that social media brings uh, to an, your particular organization. So what makes a, an explorationist? Uh, and, and I focus very much in this presentation from uh, a geoscientist perspective in terms of what is an explorationist. And there's no kind of common definition uh, in, uh, in the literature on this. And th the strand which I've been able to draw is an explorationist is an entrepreneurial geologist who deals with the unknown. Uh, it's basically a generalist who has a deep technical background, is commercially astute, and I've underlined and put this one in bold because this personal characteristic is a really important thing for me, is the person is intensely curious, resourceful, optimistic, resilient, physically fit. Uh, I don't think I've ever met uh, a, a physically unfit uh, successful explorationists. Uh, keeping at the edge of many technical disciplines, even if that person is out in the bush, and also able to work with, with minimal support. Uh, often, well, very much the case in a, a junior company, you don't have an HR department, a finance department, an IT department. You are the HR department, uh, the finance department, uh, the IT department. So you have to be a, a jack of all trades. Obviously, the entrance qualification for this is an honors degree in geology, uh, some decent experience. Accreditation in, in South Africa is very, very important uh, with SACNASP. Uh, membership of the GSSA and or SAIMM is, is also critically important in terms of a continuous learning uh, and networking with your peers. And then a whole raft of uh, softer skills, which I've noted here, of which things such as business acumen, financial management, uh, planning and organization are particularly important. Technical knowledge is absolutely vital, well beyond the Microsoft Office suite, especially going into uh, geographical information systems uh, and the like. A driver's license, fundamental. And then, this is not tongue in cheek, but actually very, very seriously, you still have need, you need to have a strong understanding of HR logistics, first aid, security, mechanics, electrical, plumbing, and cooking. Because often, if you're on a camp in the middle of a Kalahari, for example, with maybe two or three other people, you're two days drive away from uh, civilization. And if there's a plumbing issue, you're gonna have to sort it out yourself. Otherwise you may not be able to have that shower or, or go to the bathroom. You also have to be a master of, of many other uh, trades as well. What I particularly like in this uh, slide here is the, the, the picture on the top right-hand corner. These are two of my colleagues in, in Vatomi Mining Pty Limited who discovered, for want of a better word, or rediscovered is the more accurate word, a number of diamondiferous kimberlites in the free state, uh, which were last mined in the 1880s. And they found this in the archives uh, in Kimberley and in Bloemfontein. We ground truth them. Yes, they were kimberlites. Very little work had been done on them in the last two or three generations, and it became an active project. So it's not just actually working on the ground, uh, working in the office, but getting out and being intensely curious about historical data and historical information. Of course, there is the, uh, the, the logging of drill call, which you see in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, the bringing together of, of geological models and the evaluation of those models to present to your board. I'm going to talk a little bit of, uh, a bit later on about the importance of stakeholder management. So I'm not going to dwell on it partic on this uh, particular slide. Modern uh, geoscientists in, geo uh, in exploration companies obviously have to be uh, very technically literate. In this slide here, you'll see a couple of young gr uh, graduates undertaking uh, a geophysical survey on uh, Botswana Diamond's Thorny River project. On the right hand side, this is a great example for uh, any of my finance colleagues. This is Vatomi's finance director, who's multi-skilling as a drone pilot. And then 
we have on that drone a number of different technological offerings. And then something which is beginning to take off, not in the diamond space at the moment, but certainly in, in the gold and, and other minerals, is the use of artificial intelligence, uh, big data, uh, quantum physics, in terms of discovering new deposits by just looking at the data and looking at patterns. And this company, Gold Spot Discoveries, uh, won a competition two years ago uh, in terms of discovering gold deposits using data. And now they're a very successful uh, Canadian listed company, uh, typically uh, looking for gold and assisting gold exploration. So it's understanding of large data, understanding of the algorithms behind that. And at the end of the day, being able to go back and, and, and do that ground truthing. However, a good geologist can never get away from being low tech. If you're in the middle of the Kalahari, for example, uh, and this is a, uh, an early evening scene on Botswana Diamond's proje uh, Maibui project in the central Kalahari of Botswana, there's only four people uh, doing the field work itself. And so, and there's only minimal satellite communication, chiefly uh, for safety reasons, uh, more than anything else. So you have to be able to operate in a, a low tech environment too, and take everything with you. So it's that juxtaposition of being able to manage uh, in a high tech environment, but also in a low tech environment and being able to make the right decisions as to what's appropriate at that moment in time. A, a geologist also has to be a, a problem solver, is can you think strategically and solve geological riddles whilst keeping the camp running and the stakeholders happy? That's a vast raft of skills that the modern day geoscientist actually has to do. On the one hand, very high level thinking in terms of trying to uh, unwrap the, the hidden gems of the earth itself. At the meantime, making sure that, you know, your diesel generator has sufficient diesel and you've got filters and you've drained the water from the diesel because the diesel uh, may not be as good quality as you uh, have, uh, as you would like to be. And it's very important that you have the right tools for the job. Uh, in a junior company, you, not, you can't necessarily have the best technology or, or the most expensive technology. You have what is available to you and you have to actually use that technology to undertake your, your discovery work. You also have to be a servant leader and a diplomat. I, I'm a very uh, fond disciple of, of the servant leader movement, and it's not something that is typically found in the mining environment, but I think it's particularly important uh, when it comes to engaging with, with stakeholders in itself. And I think there are two very important concepts in this slide. Uh, one is that of, of cultural intelligence, and the other one is something called leadership beyond authority. Because often when you're working in a remote area uh, with, with stakeholders who've been in that area for, for generations, you don't really have any authority. You come there, you're, you have to work as an equal with those people and you have to be able to develop those projects itself. And it's, it's not just an, in South Africa, we typically uh, are very, very cognizant of that. But I thought I would also include uh, the picture of, of the previous CEO of, of Shepherd Gems, RV, RV Tau. And, and here we're looking at developing uh, a diamond uh, and moissanite and, and precious stone mine in an area of not only great natural beauty and, and kibbutzes, which is the Israeli farmland, but also in the shadow of, of Mount Carmel, which has very, very deep re religious significance um, for, for many groups of people, particularly uh, Christian people. So this is a, a very complex area. And the geologist or the geoscientist, if that person is leading the company, will have to take particular cognizance of this. You also have to be a, a socially responsible risk taker itself. And for a junior company, the geoscientist who is, uh, particularly if that person's leading, will have to be able to make those decisions uh, his or herself, where you take sufficient risks to achieve your goals, but you don't put others at risk actually with your actions itself. And, and that, that's a really fundamental point. And that will lead you into being able to get a social license to operate, which allows you to work with the acceptance 
and approval of, of the local community and the stakeholders in your area. You also have to be a communicator. I think I mentioned this uh, right at the very beginning. It's all well and good to be able to use your uh, tools in the field, develop your geological models, uh, be able to negotiate and, and collaborate with your, uh, with your stakeholders, but then you have to don a suit uh, or a, a smart dress if you're a lady and then deal uh, with ministers of, of uh, of mineral affairs and in this slide I think I can count six ministers of, of, of mineral deposits and mineral affairs throughout Africa. You have to be able to deal with the media, you have to have television interviews and you have to basically raise your game to be able to deal at that national level uh, both so you can work with with ministers who have multiple interests as well as your investors themselves. And I mentioned at the very beginning a a junior explorationist, it's not just a career. And I'm going to talk briefly towards the back end of this presentation about careers, but it's also very much a lifestyle as well, is that there's no such thing as a nine to five or an eight to four working job. You work you know, all the hours that there are available to you. You take off when you actually need to take off. and But you can have this multifaceted role of in this slide, you'll see a photograph of myself raising money in London, less than a week later, going to spend that money. Uh, thankfully, was able to raise that money in field work actually in South Africa. So it is very much uh, a lifestyle choice. And you have to be cognizant of the fact that potential investors and investors will ask you some very detailed questions about how you are spending your money, which will include where are you staying in London? Uh, what class of flight did you travel? How many people are you seeing? How are you exactly going to spend the money uh, that we may give you? Um, so you have to almost kind of live and breathe uh, this lifestyle. So touching briefly on, on, on the careers. Firstly, just for context, is the career path for a major. And I've just drawn from my experience of Anglo-American and De Beers here, and I would imagine it wouldn't be too different. Uh, you're starting off at the upper C band from a Patterson perspective as a geologist and, and potentially uh, going all the way up to upper E band, uh, being a general manager. Fairly clear hierarchical levels, incremental career progression, compensation linked to grade. And very importantly on this one, uh, and, and one doesn't know this if you actually work for the majors, but your pay is often at the 80th percentile. Uh, so you're quite comfortable as such. And the final point I want to take from this slide here is you are often quite divorced from the business. You get a budget, you do your exploration work, and, and you deliver your exploration work. How the company makes money and how the company funds your exploration is you're often quite divorced from. However, from a junior perspective, many, many fewer levels. Uh, you can go straight from geologist to COO or, or, or CEO. You're often what I would call the, the chief cook uh, and bottle washer in the organization. You're typically paid at the 20th percentile, so considerably lower salaries, but obviously that is uh, counteracted uh, by significant share options. Uh, there is a direct link between your work, company performance and shareholders, and the ultimate test here because this shows you how good a geologist you are, is the ability to raise mon uh, money. Can you raise money for the projects uh, which you have presented to the investors and then come back again six months or a year or so later saying, you gave me half a million pounds for this. Uh, this is what I have done with it. I would like another half a million pounds. This is the acid test uh, for a career path for a junior. Two questions uh, which you, know, you can ponder on after this particular presentation on uh, is can good geologists from major companies succeed in the junior world? I have my own views, but I'm going to keep that to myself for a moment. Uh, and can one transfer from being a mine or research geologist uh, to working in the junior world? So what does success look like? Uh, success in, in, from my perspective, and everybody will have their own definition, of success, and I think that's very, very important. Uh, it, it's a multifaceted thing. Commercial success has to be one of the most important things here. Have you given back the money 
plus a significant premium to the people who gave you money. Because th these people are like you and I, they've given their savings uh, to you to invest properly and to get a return. Uh, this particular example I was very fortunate to be involved with uh, was from one of my previous companies, African Diamonds, where we gave the original shareholders, when this company had just an idea and a management team and a couple of licenses, a 25 times return uh, on their overall investment. And if you were a shareholder who had continued to invest in the company throughout the life of the project, you would have still made a tenfold return on it. Then you have the softer things, which I, I think are very, very important, particularly if we're working in, in Africa. A significant contribution to the economy, jobs, absolutely vital, and then making a real difference or a legacy. So when you reach my age or perhaps a bit older, I like to still think of myself as, as young, that you can reflect back and see that you've actually made a real difference and, and there's a legacy from the work that you've actually undertaken. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a few uh, concluding remarks. I'd like to leave you with the, the kind of statement that the easy minds have all been found. Uh, and, and obviously they weren't easy at the time they were found. They, they required a huge amount of innovation and entrepreneurship and hard work. But the new minds will not only require new exploration technology and thinking around different geological models, but a very deep understanding of the historical context as to why these new deposits weren't uh, put into production previously or what changes in the geology have enabled you, or geological thinking should I say, have enabled you to kind of rediscover a deposit and bring it to commercial fruition. I'm not going to read through the, the whole slide here, I'd just like to highlight a couple of points. For a junior explorationist, Networking is absolutely fundamental and key. You'll see in the background to where I'm speaking, this is my home office, this is my office. I obviously network intensely with my family because this is where I work from, but you have to get out, you have to get to conferences, you have to have lunches and dinners with like-minded people, otherwise you can quickly go into your shell. Very importantly, if you don't do it in a junior company, nothing actually happens. It's really as simple as that. So you have to be an, an initiator. Uh, of projects. You have to have a high tolerance for, for risk and uncertainty. This doesn't mean that you take foolhardy risks. It means you have to have a bit of a thick skin uh, that you, you can understand that uh, and some of these projects won't work out well because that's the nature of exploration, but you just have to keep going until you find something and you're successful. And then find the final two points on this slide Earning the trust of investors is absolutely key. I've been in the junior industry for 15 years and, and I think maybe I've done 20 different fundraising rounds uh, in that time. And I was just chatting to uh, Dr. Marshall and Dr. Smith before we actually went on uh, live on this about what does a pandemic mean in this area? Because we have all witnessed three or more different crashes 2009 being the latest one, but they have had ones before that. But what does this mean uh, for funding exploration? Because it does fill me uh, still with dread, but you know, one is tenacious and one will make a plan. And then finally, I think one of the, the key differentiators between working with a junior and working with a major is with a junior, there's a sound potential for self-actualization and really making a genuine difference in our profession and in our society. Thank you very much indeed for your time and uh, I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Thank you, James. Um, that was very good. Um, we can open the floor to questions and I think if you just raise your hand, we'll try and answer them. You'll have to unmute your mic yourself. Craig, will we these do these one at a time or three at a time? What works best? Well, I'm not sure. It depends, it depends on how many we've got here. I, um, okay. I don't see anybody raising their hand at the moment. There's one. There's two, I think. I've got no lean plus one other. Um, it's no lean, yeah. I was just going to say, Perhaps do one at a time, James. Okay, no problem, thank you. 
We've got one from Tim. Uh, yes, how's it going? Um, one thing I think you could have also added there was that the junior exploration geologist also becomes a de facto health and safety and environmental officer and has to police himself. Very good point, Tim. Uh, yes. I may have actually, uh, I did include it, but I didn't emphasize it. It's a very, very important point. Absolutely. Uh, because legal responsibility uh, rests entirely uh, with that person in the field. And so the management of, of safety and health systems is absolutely vital. And then the question I had for you was, you posed the question of, can someone from a major become a junior? Um, how does a jun uh, someone who's trained as a junior fit in, it, well, do they fit into a major where, as you said, they've had a finger in every pie basically, and now they have to fit into a corporate structure where they don't control everything. Tim, I have found not just in uh, working in, in the kind of junior space uh, and in the major space in Diamonds, but also in the, uh, the two smaller charity organizations, one which I was a chairman of for 15 years and, and the current one which I'm a chairman of, is that we, we find it quite a challenge for people who've worked in large corporate structures uh, to make that transition to, to the junior world itself. If they make it when they're around about 40-ish, then it's fine because they're, they're then young enough to unlearn some of this stuff. But going the other way around is unless that major has a, a culture, and certainly I was very privileged when I worked at the Beers, uh, we, we did have an intensely entrepreneurial culture in the exploration arm. Uh, led by Bill McKechnie and, and Craig was uh, on the management team there. Uh, but it all depends on organizational culture, Tim. Uh, and, and I found in today's kind of risk management uh, and, and governance world, it, it is very difficult for a junior person to go back into a, a corporate. Can I add a comment to that? Um, yes. I, from my personal career path, I'd like to see more uh, cross-fertilization between the academic and the industry world, the academic and the exploration worlds. I, I think that's fairly critical because that, that tends to feed in innovation. And we maybe don't see enough of that. Craig, I, I think that's a really important point you raise is that uh, as a junior, you, you don't get access to, you know, quality academic thinking and and new developments in technology unless you actually go to uh, particular conferences. And just to give you one small example of to, uh, you know, to confirm your point is that we had some very long discussions with Professor Tapp from the University of Johannesburg at last year's International Kimberlite Conference. And now he's doing a whole load of dating work for us uh, on, on Kimberlites and uh, Kimberlites, which have done very, had very, very little written about them. So he's doing exactly what he wants to get done and what he wants to achieve out of it. And importantly from us, we're getting some really sophisticated uh, academic uh, interrogation around the work that we're doing. We don't do enough of it, Craig, but I think it's a really important point. Any other comments or questions? Tanya, do you have anything to add? I see someone's raised uh, their hand. I think that might be me. Ah. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting talk, James. Um, my question is hopefully not going to put me in a, in a bad light. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about if there is a dog eat dog culture? Because obviously juniors are working very hard to earn the money that they have. Are there sort of undercurrent games? Do you sabotage each other? Do you, you know, set each other's camps alight? Or is it all generally a very respectful working environment? It's, it's actually a very, very good question. Uh, and I, I'm smiling a little bit. I can only obviously talk about it from a diamond perspective. Uh, 
but it's exactly the opposite of what you describe is if I look at the, the CEOs of Pangolin Diamonds, of Blue Rock Diamonds, of Sodilo Diamonds, uh, of uh, vast resources, there is an intense amount of collaboration. The only area uh, really uh, where you know, we, we keep very much to ourselves is uh, the application for prospecting licenses uh, and you know, our intellectual capital behind that. But we very often uh, share information uh, with, you know, under a confidentiality agreement at all and ask actually help from each other. I've certainly done that uh, with many of the colleagues I've actually spoken about there. I think if there is a dog eat dog, it's more in terms of if you find something significant uh, and you know, you, you've kind of gone up uh, uh, the kind of resource road, you, your share price has risen up, and it's a struggle often for an exploration company to raise the larger amounts of money to develop an indicated resource, to develop a feasibility study and things like that. You then find uh, the, not necessarily the majors, uh, but the mid-tier companies will then start to uh, look at you as a takeover target. And there's no such thing really as a hostile takeover uh, in today's market. But equally, there's no such thing as a friendly takeover either. And, and if, if I use your words of a dog eat dog, that's perhaps where it is in the industry rather than uh, at the junior level where there is a, a, a much higher degree of collaboration. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your insights and your experience with us. Much appreciated. Thank you. We've got one more. We've got another question here from uh, Ben, I think. I'm um, 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 hi. Hi, James. Good. Um, good. Um, I just, just a quick question. I just I'm still a student. I just want to understand, like, in terms of um, young uh, exploration companies, what what is the guide that uh, we can get in terms of which commodity to focus on, like things like understanding the market. How, how do you usually approach approach this kind of thing? But, but it's a good question that uh, if it answer your which which market should you actually go into? Um, I obviously will talk to my own book about diamonds. It goes without saying uh, that you know there will always be a strong market for diamonds because it represents the uh, the, the ultimate form of relationship between uh, two different people and representing love. So that will always be there. And that their diamond mines are generally getting older and declining. So, you know, that economic need has to be filled. But equally at the moment, you can't get away from the fact that battery metals are, are going to be probably one of the stronger commodities uh, because the, the need in terms of sustainable power uh, and those kind of things. So how do you find out about this? Well, attend presentations such as this and, uh, and one of the other GS, GSSA presentations during the week. Be an avid reader uh, of, of the newspapers, of, of the, uh, especially things like the Business Day, where you can see the price of, of commodities. Uh, follow different companies uh, from a stock exchange perspective uh, to see how well they are doing or, or not, as the case may be. And what this does, it actually all prepares you when you go for an interview for one of these companies that you are so well informed about the market for that particular mineral and the market and, and the company itself. So you almost need to have that kind of consistent homework of looking at the industry all the time, looking at the industry uh, websites, looking at the YouTube clips of, of, of the CEO, reading the newspaper. There's a lot about economics at the moment. Uh, you know, in, in the pandemic, there are lots of people have lots and lots of different views. It is very complicated. Uh, but I read a lot about it at the moment because it ha will have a fundamental impact on my business. You must be a ferocious reader and be intensely curious, I think. If that's of any help, Ben. Okay, okay, that sounds great. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other, any other questions or comments?
I don't see anything more. No one's got their hand up. Going once, going twice. James, with that, I'd like to thank you very much for the presentation. Tanya, would, do you have any comments to make? I guess not. With that, I'll call this meeting closed and I'll end the meeting now. Thank you very much indeed, Craig. Thank you for having me. Thank you very Good much. Goodbye, all. Cheerio.